Junkie Nation, gorgeous George, and goes at it again. Another MMA superstar joining us here on the video hotline. It's former Strike Force Bantamweight champion, former UFC Bantamweight champion, current one championship VP, Misha Tate. What's up, Takedown? What's up, Cupcake? Man, it's been a minute. So much has changed. I mean, I moved back from Singapore. I'm back in the States now. Um, Had a second baby. So he's actually in the back. I don't know if you can see that little, that he's sleeping back there. So hopefully I don't wake him up. If I get too excited, let me know. (laughs) You hear baby crying, you'll you'll know what it is. Congratulations on the arrival of the second baby. I remember talking to you when you were pregnant with the second baby. The second Mm -hmm. baby was born in Singapore, right? Yeah. Yeah. During a pandemic, no less. During a pandemic, yeah. Didn't even make it to the hospital, actually. He was, he was, uh, arrived in like three hours. So we ended up having him on the bathroom floor, which was, uh, that was intense, but it was pretty cool. Uh, so that wasn't the plan. What, what, what happened? Did the pandemic slow things down? Like nobody can, could arrive within three hours or you just couldn't be moved once it happens? Obviously, you can tell I've never had. No, like it literally, well, my first, um, not to get too in detail, my first one was three days of labor and I tried to have her at home. And then this one I planned to have at the hospital at Daxton, but he came in three hours. So I just kind of miscalculated. And by the time it was like, we should definitely go to the hospital. I was like, I can't move anymore. Like that's, that's all I could do was be in labor. So I was like, leave me alone. We're having this baby here. And that's what we did. How about that? All right. Well, yeah. again, congratulations. And uh, Singapore, what was that about a, a one a year and a half experiment, right? Uh, you're still with yeah. the company, but now you're reporting from the states. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I my goal was to be there for two years, but COVID kind of just messed everything up, as you know, it did for everybody. I know I'm not the only one in that. So you know, when Singapore locked down, I just got kind of depressed, and it was really lonely because you. I couldn't have any family, no friends, nobody come to visit. And you just realize how small it is. I'm from Washington state, which is where I'm at right now, staying with my parents through the holidays until uh, I'll be back in Vegas, uh, probably around January. But, um, you know, it's something like 260 Singapore's fit in Washington state, somewhere around that number. And um, if that gives you any perspective, I mean, you just, it's so small. I just, I was craving like a road trip camping, hiking. Uh, I just wanted to get out and about. And, you know, to Singapore's credit, they're super strict. So COVID was really um, handled beautifully, but it was extremely difficult to navigate any kind of a normal life because the, you know, the gym shut down, um, even the private pool shut down. You had to be, if you were outside, it was, you absolutely had to wear a mask and it's like a thousand degrees and a thousand percent humidity all the time. So you know, it just was difficult. And then no family, no friends. Because prior to that, you know, I was just traveling a lot. We were, you know, one championship was throwing a ton of events. So I was just on the move. And it was not, you know, I wasn't focusing on that stuff. I was working and, and it was good. And then COVID hit and it was a forced slowdown, but um, just made you made us really realize, again, what's important, you know, family, friends, those things in life, uh, they have to come first. And that's why we decided to move back early, um, but still working with the company and glad that I was able to make that transition um, back to the States and still stay with one. Will that change your role at all? I remember when we spoke a few months ago, The Apprentice was going to be something you'd be a part of, but I think The Apprentice is being filmed now, or maybe it right. is, I don't know, but what's, what's your role going forward? Yeah, so I will not be a part of The Apprentice this time. It was just going to be a little too challenging, I think, to navigate with uh, the baby. Um, I wasn't able to leave him home and then to fly with him would have been, you know, uh, I already did that once and it was it was difficult. So fortunately, um, I was able to stay here. But I think, you know, what we're really going to gear more towards is uh, me working more with our U.S. athletes like uh, uh, Demetrius Johnson. You know, he's in Washington State as well. Um, so I want to get together with him and film more content, pick his brain, uh, create more media. And then, and then, um, of course, you know, still promoting the events and anything that I can do, um, you know, with my connections to help further the roots that, uh, one championship is still trying to lay. Cause eventually, you know, still want to come to the U S it's just, um, COVID, you know, everything about 2020 is, but COVID. <laughs> Tell me about your experience in Singapore with, uh, Chatri Sidiotong. 
Harvard graduate, billionaire, successful businessman. How, how did that go? How much did you learn? You know, Chatri is a, a very, very busy man, but I do enjoy his um, his speeches. You know, it's not like we got to hang out very often. He's constantly on the go. He's, um, you know, somebody that is, you know, not easily accessible because he pushes himself um, every day to the 100%. So I think what I learned from that is, um, you know, that setting the bar high. And the other thing that I love about Chaudhry though, is that he does understand that family comes first and it, and it comes first for him too. And training, you know, being a martial artist, like he encourages everybody there to, you know, take, take their leave from the, from work and go and train and spend time with their family, you know, that the job comes second. And I love that outlook and I appreciate that. And that's, you know, it's something when you're a young parent and you're learning to navigate it all. And like, I'm an ambitious person, so I tend to load my plate up either way, but just having a mentor who reminds you that, look, we, we know you have those high expectations for yourself and, and that's great, but just remember family comes first. Like that's such a cool thing to hear from your boss and your leader. Cause he's absolutely right. Misha, I want to focus a little bit on retirement, okay? Uh, 2020 has cost us a lot of great fighters, and I want to pick your book a little bit. What's one thing that you can say in retirement that uh, you did not expect that surprised you? About retirement? Uh-huh. Hmm. One thing about retirement. Ooh, I should have thought about this one before. I mean... I think, you know, much about retirement, it's just about like how, how life changes in general, like when you go a different direction, um, you know, that it can be really scary, but it can be really exhilarating. Um, you know, like, I fly under the radar a lot more, which I've, I welcomed, I really enjoy being able to take that step back and um, become more a fan of the sport again, because when you're in it, it's difficult to be as much of a fan, you know, because you're, you're doing it. And um, I think now that I get to step back and have the perspective, you know, the hindsight perspective, and I really get to look back and reflect on my career, you know, as it's, as it from, from a start to a finish, if that makes sense. I know I'm still doing uh, things involved in MMA, but when I look back at my fight career, I can really say like, wow, you know, I had no idea at that time that this would impact in that way. So I guess um, perspective, you know, perspective is everything. You know, next week, it'll be four years since you retired. And I wanted to ask you, do you feel like you were in the golden era of women's MMA? Like, it's almost a, it's almost a general question for MMA. Uh, well, I should have said it's almost a question in general for both men and women. But I feel like now is things is becoming so much more of a business and a sport. Not to say it wasn't that when you were there, but when you were there, you guys were so individualized. Like, I always think of pink and purple with you, you know? And right now, everything's different, it seems like. You know, there was something special, I think, about the era that I got to be a part of. Um, but I think these things come in cycles, you know? And there's an ebb and flow to the sport in general. And it's not just women's MMA, you know? This is... I think we came in hot, you know, because it was Rhonda and I, and there was that rivalry. And anytime that you have a rivalry inside a sport, it adds that much interest and the investment that the fans can put into it. But, you know, we, we came in hot and now maybe it's just at a little bit of a lull, but I think it will build up again. Um, this happens in the men's divisions too. You know, there's, there's times when, you know, John Jones, for instance, you know, and Daniel Cormier, like they keep it hot. But other than that, then it's like, oh, what's next for John Jones? He's beat everybody. You know, it happens um, in general. So, you know, this is maybe was the, the time that I got to be there was, you know, it was great. And I'm so uh, thankful for that opportunity. And you, I guess you could call it the golden era right now, but I think it'll come back around again. And, you know, the women will flourish and there'll be another golden era. Tell me about women's MMA, like compare it, you know, what you've seen and experienced in the UFC and now 
last weekend I was watching that the first Matrix, and it was really cool to see Tiffany Tail. Uh, I, I want to know, like, is you think women's MMA will take off for one championship the way it took off for the UFC is my question. Oh, I think without a doubt. I mean, the, there are women there that, I mean, they just fight with their, their heart and their soul. And I think, you know, Asia and some of the countries over there still have a long way to go in supporting women. You know, not every place is behind the curve, but there are many more places that are behind the curve than in the U.S. And I think the U.S. kind of isn't is at the forefront of supporting women in general. But, you know, fighting sports over there, these women still have to go through um, kind of the things that I did in the beginning of my career, where I think, um, you know, women getting into mixed martial arts now in the U.S., it's it's not such a taboo thing to do. It's kind of more like the cool thing to do. To do. And um, it's not that way for a lot of women who are coming up through the ranks and through the hardships uh you know, on the one championship roster. So it's a different kind of vibe that you get there. But I mean, I always say if you build it, they will come. And I believe that the, the women, you know, are globally, not just for one championship, but everywhere will continue. You know, we were talking on Sirius XM, uh, RJ Clifford and I were today and talking about how the women's divisions and it's through no fault of their own in the UFC are kind of just, um, you know, there's not maybe enough to fill the three divisions. There's not enough women, talented women that's kind of spread out through different organizations. And then the UFC has these three divisions and it's kind of difficult sometimes to, to come up with like an ample amount of competition. But I keep saying like, if you build it, they, they will come. So it's just going to take more time, you know, on the one championship side, on the UFC side, this is a common denominator, um, you don't want to call it a problem, but it's just something that we, you know, we have to get through. And that, I, but I promise you, I go into the, when I used to go into the gym 14 years ago, 15 years ago, and I would walk into the wrestling room and then graduated to MMA, there were no other really like females. And especially in the kids programs, I mean, it was rare to see little girls in there and now it's not, it is not rare. Like these little girls are going to grow up to be heroes someday. And, um, I, I really look forward to that day. And now I have a daughter of my own, you know, she's two years old and she gets on the mat with, mats with me and she wants to wrestle and she wants to try to take me down. And it's just, it's so cool. And so I know that there are women, um, that are starting from a starting point that, you know, my generation never had that opportunity. Yeah, and folks, you got to keep an eye on Stamp Fairtex, Angela Lee. Uh, I already mentioned Jung Jingnan, Tiffany Teo. Uh, Nicolini is another one that I've enjoyed. Um, and then um, Sage Northcutt's sister, Colby, I think, has also made her debut as well. So they're definitely building over there. As far as here in North America, I just thought of something, Misha, when you were mentioning you and Rhonda and bringing things along. Um, it could be that at the same time, since this is, a, you know, the UFC is a USA based organization and a lot of its pay-per-view audience and a lot of what drives traffics on the sites that you and I probably frequent are a lot of American readers. And man, if you think about it, a, a lot of the women uh, outside the USA are the ones holding the belts, you know, I mean, Rose is obviously going to be competing soon, but I, I was having trouble thinking of some of the ladies that could maybe help bring it back. And that's not to say that a foreigner can't. We can fall in love with with a foreigner. I mean, a lot of people came to grow to love Joanna. You know what I mean? But it, I think it's a longer road for the foreign ladies than the, uh, the American-based ladies, at least here in the U.S. I'm not sure how that'll be in Asia. Yeah, I agree. But I think that's the kind of thing that makes you really hungry and gives you a great story. I mean, a lot of the athletes in one championship have the best – most amazing stories that just make you take a step back and sound, say like, wow, like, you know, where they came from, where they're going. Um, you know, Stamp Fairtex, you mentioned her. I mean, her story is just incredible. If you guys get a chance to look it up, I mean, she she's just somebody to be admired, you know, truly like a Rocky Balboa, if you will. And, um, you know, Zhang Jingnan, she's the first, uh, first Chinese world champion. And, you know, she's just a beast. Uh, 
And Angela Lee, you know, she's an American. She comes from Hawaii. Her whole family is like embedded in fighting her, 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 you know, all of her siblings compete and are just little, little up and coming animals. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's so fun to watch all these different walks of life and all these women and young men and everybody making their way, you know, in a sport that's just full of passion and desire. And uh, I love it. You know, tomorrow there'll be a one championship event uh, here on the Pacific time zone. It's 5.30 a.m. On the Eastern time zone, it's 8.30 a.m. BR Live. Tell, tell the fans what's something about one championship they should observe you know, a lot of people, I think, are slowly warming up to it, especially now with the presence on BR Live and TNT. But what's something that maybe goes under the radar that people uh, might not realize that does make a one championship show something that you got to watch? Well, first of all, the production is out of this world. Um it would be a real treat to attend a one championship event live. I mean, if you ever get the chance, do it. The lights, the audio, the um, walkouts, uh, it's just something that's mind blowing. I've never seen anything like it. And um, if you ever got to go to a live event and you buy floor seats, like they're walking around catering you food and stuff, you know, granted you go to like a big event. I mean, so the production is just incredible. Um, And then the, I guess maybe if you're not inside it, you might not get to feel like the family vibe of it. And um, the stories, the the stories of these athletes, there are so many that have come from hardship, um, you know, because in Asia, a lot of these fighters, you know, coming from Thailand, coming from Vietnam, coming from uh, Myanmar, coming from, these are places where, Fighters are coming from the bottom rungs of society. This is not, they're not privileged. It's not a privileged sport. It's not like, you know, mommy and daddy took them to Taekwondo and put them in a kid's program and, you know, supported them. No, these fighters have had to claw their way up as a means of survival since they were children. And it's truly incredible to watch um, how passionate they are when they fight and just their pre-fight interviews and their walkouts and you know how it's really it's not a hobby it's not a sport it is their livelihood and that's just something that really stands out to me because I love a good uh you know a good comeback story or a great story about somebody um persevering and getting through hardships because I just find it incredibly uh inspirational so the athlete stories really do stand out to me um as some of the most motivating and incredible um feats for these athletes to really be there and and have an opportunity with one championship you know that they wouldn't ever um i don't believe they would ever have otherwise to make those dreams come true and provide for their families you are so right Watching one championship definitely reminds me a lot of pride. And I don't know, for one, that's something that they want to detach themselves from or not. It's just that I've been lucky enough to see both eras. But you're right. It is a pulsating vibe from the audio, all that production, all those lights. It is awesome. I loved it. It was definitely worth getting up for four title fights last week. Man, what a great way for them to make, you know, to, to get going again. Okay, here's my last question. And this is actually one of the original reasons um, we went ahead. You know, we, we asked if we could talk to you. Uh, my girlfriend, Juliet, who you met on our military trip, she was asking me, what do you think Americans think of everything that's happening in the United States with the election? Now, I don't want this to I don't want you to think this is a politics question. OK, Trump, Biden, none of that. What I wanted to know was, as an American who was living in another part of the world, how did, I guess, you're going to have to answer maybe on behalf of Singapore or, or anybody maybe that you had that expressed themselves to you about it. How how does another country view us? Uh, I don't have too many friends that live a- abroad, um, but I happen to know, know you and I thought you were still living there when we booked you. But then we came to find out you were living in Vegas. But just can you tell us when you were living there, um, did that come across the news? What did it seem like? like did it seem like a U.S. you wanted to get back to aside from family friends camping hiking all that um so you know it was it's really eye-opening to me how important the u.s is to everyone else in the world you know like we don't hear about 
you know, Singapore's elections or, you know, I mean, we hear if you follow politics, I mean, sure, we do. We hear we pay attention to what's going on in North Korea and we pay attention a little bit what's going on. But but it 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 really is impactful how the U.S. represents itself to the rest of the world. And um, to be honest, the perception it was what a shit show, like what is going on? <laughs> what is going on in America, especially, you know, when there was all the looting and the burning down? I mean, people were just taken back by it. And I mean, it was a hot topic of conversation all the way in little tiny Singapore. And people were like, what is going on in the U.S.? You know, it was just crazy. And it was it was embarrassing. Like, it was really embarrassing to be American for a minute because everyone's kind of like, oh, you're from America. And they expect you to explain it somehow. Like, well, you're an American. So, you know, what's what's the deal? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm not over there burning buildings and looting, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what's going on right now, but I get it. it and, and it's really embarrassing. And I'm just going to like walk away with my head kind of <laughs> low. So, um, you know, the perception of America is just that, yeah, it's craziness and the, the shit show that's going on, the, you know, and I obviously, you know, Trump just, you know, he is the way that he is. And, um, his tweets and the way that he represents himself, you know, regardless of good things he does or not, not, you know, that he just represents himself. Um, He represents himself poorly and he represents America. Um, So that's, that's the frustrating part. You know, I think that Trump has some great qualities to him, but the way he represents himself is, I know we weren't really going there, but I'm just talking in general, how the, you know, how we're perceived is, you know, his tweets are outrageous sometimes. And you're just like, just, just dial it back a little bit. Like, I, I you know, because that's what people are, are paying attention to is so the way, you know, the way that you're representing yourself. And, you know, he just kind of, I don't know, it, it looked bad. But definitely people were, were taken back by it. I loved your answer. So honest, raw, powerful. Um, and I did want to say one thing because you know how, the MMA world is someone can take something the wrong way. You in no way said you were embarrassed to be an American. You, you felt, I guess, can you clarify that part? Uh, I don't want anyone to run wild with a quote or anything like that. Well, you know, um, no, I mean, I'm always going to be proud to be an American, but that doesn't mean that there's not embarrassing moments. Like I think yeah. all of us as Americans should be, you know, embarrassed about how our country was kind of being, you know, uh, represented. Like we're better than that. We are, um, we're America. And um, I, I always want to be proud to be an American. I always will be proud to be an American, but I was embarrassed by the way that our country was um, being covered and the things that were happening. Now, I believe that's the minority of people that were acting that way. But I mean, when that's everything that you're seeing on the news, I mean, you just, it just seemed like all of America was misbehaving. And um, that was just, yeah, I mean, it was difficult to, um, when people expect you to explain that somehow because you're American, you're kind of like, I don't, I don't really know why, what's going on. Like in that, that's my country. You know, I'm always going to have my country's back, but you're kind of like just wishing that things were better in America. And it's just so crazy. Like the polarizing aspects of everything going on that you don't really know how to explain it. And, and that's really what it is. You know, I love my country, but we are better than that. And we need to represent ourselves better than that. I got you. Yep. I wish our country right now was how those three days were when we were at the military base, man, those days felt so good. Just seeing it. I felt so patriotic, but I think we can get back there, Misha. I know we will. Um, thanks for answering that question. You know, uh, like I said, I've been, I've been wondering it myself, just what the perception is from other countries and what, what they're thinking. Because I watch the news and I see stuff go down in other countries and I'm like, wow, you know, some things I admire and some things I'm like, well, I'm glad we're not them. So appreciate your answer. You know, if you notice, Joe popped in for a second that he had some audio problems and he wanted me to ask you one last question. Uh, he, he says, out of the fighters that retired recently, Cejudo, Cormier, Anderson Silva and Habib Nurmagomedov. Um, 
do you think any of them will come out of retirement? And if so, which one first? Um, it would, I mean, I gotta say, uh, Habib, I still think that he's going to want to come back for that one last fight. And I know he's, um, you know, a man who doesn't make decisions lightly. So I do think it will take him time. Um, and I think he thought about his retirement and I believe he was sincere in that, but you know, he is such a, such a, uh, a beast and a, an excellent fighter. And I think, uh, 30 and Oh, I think it would just gnaw away at him with, with some time. So I, I believe we'll see at least one more fight from Khabib. I also think that Henry Cejudo, there's a chance that he makes a comeback. Um, those would be the two that I would, ex um, I wouldn't be surprised, right. If they made a comeback. Thank you so much for the time. Hopefully the baby's okay. Uh, <laughs> and we didn't wake him up there, but congratulations again on the, the birth of your second child and everything you've done, you know, at least from how I got to know you on the MMA front, you've been a world champion. I'm sure you'll be the same as a mother of two. So great to have you back in the States. Hopefully we see you soon in Vegas once the pandemic's over. And uh, thanks as always for the time here on Junkie Radio. Yeah, I appreciate it. And thanks for you guys for putting up with me in a, in a car and just coming home from the gym. I've been just like super motivated to get back in there and train and, and have fun because I've missed it. You know, that's the one that that's the, the one thing that sucks sometimes. It doesn't suck, but it, it's hard like being being the female, you know, having to like carry the baby and all that good stuff. You know, it's like you have to take so much time off. So I'm in it. Um, I know Chris Cyborg has mentioned uh, a grappling match and, you know, she kind of made a friendly call out. So, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to do my best to make that happen in 2021, hyper motivated. Um, but yeah, thank you guys again for having me and always a pleasure and uh, take care, stay safe. Uh, you too. You yeah, too. Wash and hopefully, that, hopefully that grappling uh, exhibition or match happens. That'll be interesting. Yeah, I hope so. I'm I'm gonna do my part to be ready for it sometime in 2021. It's friendly, right? You guys didn't have any beef on that movie set. No, she's always so incredibly respectful, and um, you know, I'm I'm not fighting anymore, but uh, I I want to get back into competition shape, and and I would love to do that grappling match with her. So been very motivated, been been getting back in there and training and not missing any days and yeah i appreciate it so big thank you to chris for that because um she really helped to motivate me again very cool all right enjoy your night thanks again yeah take care <laughs>